Hello everybody, great to see you here this evening. So I'm going to start with a tune on the harp. This is an old Irish uh, slow air called Limerick's Lament, so I hope you enjoy it. Ta fáilte rov gur léirí cairde, gur tí an ocháid speisialta ar an trónan seo. Good evening and welcome to everybody that's come uh, tonight to honour the memory of John McTiernan, county librarian and historian. And I'd like to first of all thank Kate for a wonderful rendition of a beautiful tune, very fitting for the occasion, I think. So thank you again, Kate. And I'd now like to call upon Cahirlock Councillor Michael Clark to open proceedings. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, 
As Cahirlach of Sligo County Council, I am delighted to welcome you to this special edition of The Word, a tribute to the late John C. McTiernan, renowned county librarian, historian and author. I would like to extend a special welcome to John's family, Sister Dolores, his sister and his niece Joan. I would also wel welcome John's extended family and the friends joining us here in Sligo Centre Library and to all you watching online. This tribute evening acknowledges John's wonderful legacy to Sligo, his work doc documenting the history of Sligo and its people and his ge generosity in sharing his learning and helping other historians. John's published works are an invaluable resource for researchers, historians, and anyone wanting to learn about Sligo, the people, and the places at its core. I look forward to the panel's discussion exploring John's lifelong interest and contribution to genealogy, local history, and the GAA. And on behalf of Sligo County Council, I wish to express gratitude to John's dedication and service as County Librarian to Sligo. Enjoy the evening and thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Cahirlach. Uh, I now hand over to our moderator for this evening's event, uh, writer Niamh McCabe, who will introduce the panel to you. Niamh. Thanks very much, Donal. I actually wasn't expecting to introduce the panel, so I'm just going to get my notes. But um, So we have three wonderful people um, who are going to talk to us about John and their experience of John. Beside me here we have Michael Farry, historian and author of Sligo, the Irish Revolution, 1912 to 1923, and many more books, also a fantastic poet. Beside Michael, we have Dr. Fiona Gallagher, historian and author of Streets of Sligo, and many more. And we have Cahal Martin, the secretary of Calera Strandhill GAA. And all of these people have direct contact with John. Cahal has contact with John from, um, as a child, so it'll be very interesting to get his perspective. So you're very welcome all here tonight. Um, in my bit of research for tonight, I, um, I looked, obviously, I looked into John C. McTiernan and the amount of work that he published astounded me. I have some of it here in a pile at my feet. Um, and I would like to open up our discussion, first of all, with, um, I'm going to quote from his book, from one of his books called uh, Worthies of Sligo. He prefaced this book with quotes from various dignitaries of bygone days. And these quotes that I'm going to, these two quotes I'm going to read are specifically regarding Sligonians. Some astute observations of Sligonians. I'll read out two notable ones. The first one is from the painter and antiquarian George Petrie, who following his travels in Sligo in 1837, remarked about Sligo people. The people of this country, that is North Sligo, are a peculiar race, quite Gothic in appearance, fair complexioned with light hair, blue eyes and very handsome. The women are remarkable for their strength and their thickness of their limbs. <laughs> they are all a civil, intelligent and obliging people. So that was nice. So. <laughs> And the second quote that I'm going to, um, going to read out is, um, because I feel the men of Sligo might feel excluded, so um, we have you covered. You'd be glad to know that our own Colonel Cooper of Markery said of Sligo men in 1886, where is he now? Cooper, yeah. The type of the Sligo peasant is broad and thick-set, Rather than, rather than tall. And the old people have told me that in former days, man for man, the Sligo militia 
covered more ground than the Munster regiments. So that's also nice. So <laughs> I just thought I'd open with that because there was some hugely interesting things and um, historical interesting tidbits I came across when I was doing my research, but I am not the expert. We have the three experts here. And I'm going to just um, kick off the discussion by asking Fiona if she can give us a little background of her dealings with John. Thank you very much. It would, um, you know, I know John since I was not quite a teenager, but not long after it. Um, I started off um, working for the County Sligo Heritage and Genealogical Centre in 1986. And John, of course, was the very esteemed county librarian then. And as John been involved ever since, he re really right up until he died with the Heritage Centre and the staff there. So one of our projects, you know, as a student in the, in the centre was to do a history project on Sligo. So we all got marched up to the library in the course house and uh, I decided I was going to do something on the street names and we all know where that led you know so um, you know that was my first interaction with John and I really it, it, it just grew and grew over the 30 years I got to know him very well I really enjoyed his company but most importantly he was very influential and very formative in my own um, professional training as a historian and indeed when I went back to college in my terrified mid-40s to do the PhD you know, the weight of even a, a letter that John wrote, um, you know, to the, the Maynooth University helped me get back on that after being away from education for quite a while. So I think, you know, John, uh, we've pr probably forgotten that the uh, county librarian was quite an important official, particularly when John went through, um, went through the, 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 his, his period of that, particularly Cork, Kilkenny in here. So he was a huge influence on me and I enjoyed, um, enjoyed many of the travels with him. And we might talk a little bit more about that later as well. Yeah, thank, thank you, Fiona. What a role model he must have been uh, to someone returning, returning to third level education. Um, you, you, at one point, Fiona, you said um, that John considered himself a chronicler rather than a historian. What's the difference? Well, I think John... I suppose it's an interesting distinction. We're all used to, uh, maybe now, that local history is actually a discipline. But when John would have been a um, librarian in Kilkenny and Cork, local studies was considered the sort of the, the baby of, you know, if you were a local historian, you weren't really a proper academic historian. I mean, local studies were folklore and about town land. That didn't really count. And, of course, there's a totally different... Um, uh, a totally different field now. Local studies is um, particularly from Maynooth and even from our own St. Angela's here is a discipline within itself. And John pioneered that. But he never considered himself to be um, an analytical historian. He, although I consider he was in many of his books, but he considered himself a chronicler, that he gathered all these stories in a pre-digital age um, from various sources and he reproduced them in a shape or form for everybody to read, enjoy, understand, and to kind of ignite um, a desire to read more. And that's what John himself would have, I think, considered himself. He was a lot more than that, but um, uh, this is, it's a distinction. I thought. Thanks, Fiona. Um, I'm going to ask you, Cahill, um, because you, you knew him as a child, as in you were, you were a child when you first met him, and you're the only one of our panel who, who did. Um, through your child's eyes, what was your impression of the man? Can you tell us about when you first met him, for instance? Yeah, um, well, Sean and my late father were friends. Um, as we know, the Tiernans moved to the Calera Peninsula um, when Sean was very young from Giva. Um, so I suppose this was his first involvement or his first sight of the Calera Peninsula. They came to a new farm in Caramore, which... Uh, landed him in the middle of a very historic area and I'm sure it was a playground that he had during his youth which probably um, gave him an interest, an early interest in history. Um, yeah, he, they knew each other as young fellas, my father and himself. Um, I remember a conversation about serving mass through Latin in the old Ransborough church. So they'd obviously, you know, they'd known each other a long time and become good friends. So when my father brought me to an under-12 training session in spring of 1980, Sean immediately took an interest in his friend's son, and I suppose I was being looked on as I was going to be the fellow that would bring back an All-Ireland to Sligo or whatever. Um, but um, I can remember on that day, like, there was huge excitement. 
Peter Cooney, uh, the training was in Peter Cooney's field and Peter was out with a bucket of lime lining a pitch for a senior match which was going to take place later on that day and I can remember Peter had a pep in his step and an extra broad smile as he announced to my father that Sean McTiernan was present. So I suppose that was the first time I saw Sean, like Sean remained the same over the next 40 years. I evolved, I was going to say maybe into a mature adult, but into a person in his 50s anyway. <laughs> and um, the club evolved also. And like uh, over, Sean became chairman in 1981, just a year after he arrived into the club. And straight away, um, things started to happen. And... Um, like we had had a very good committee. I, I noticed some of them in the audience here tonight, so I have to give them all praise. But I think maybe Sean's arrival presented a leadership and there were issues there which maybe people would talk about, but they were afraid to push the button. Uh, one notably that comes to mind is the amalgamation at the time. The, un the team I played in in 1980, our biggest rivals was Strand Hill. So we had a sort of a rural and an urban divide on the Calera Peninsula. And um, one of the first things that happened was those rivalries were put aside and we got back together. And the club, which is now Clara Strand Hill, as we know it today, was formed. And um, it has gone from strength to strength. I suppose another, the next thing that would have happened after that was we moved to Ransborough Park, which was a newly developed um, facility thanks to Ransborough Development Association at the time. We became less dependent on the charity of individuals and the club started with still some help but started to be able to stand on its own two feet and Carlo I'm interested in this rivalry <laughs> yeah. kind of, um, because it is, is it is it true that Sean helped in bringing the sides together what was it his influence that brought the sides together his ideas definitely um, as I say it would have probably been thought about and discussed and people would have said it should happen but it hadn't happened until Sean arrived. And I would definitely, looking back, think that it was Sean's leadership skills. He, he, he was a great man to mediate. Um, I, Bill Clinton paid compliment to George Mitchell last week. He said, um, you know, that he, George was able to change your mind without you knowing it. I feel <laughs> Sean possessed the same skill. And um, yeah, definitely I would say that while I would have to give credit to the other members of the committee, it was Sean's leadership skills that finally managed to make that breakthrough and give us the club that we have today. Brilliant. Thanks, thanks, Carl, for that insight. And Michael, I am going to um, come to you now. You've mentioned that his book, Historic Sligo, which was published in 1965, was an eye-opener for you and a great help in compiling your book, Caloran and Kulani. Can you tell us how John's book and his writings in general have helped you in your own work? Well, I suppose you have to remember, of course, in those days I had gone through um, primary school and secondary school and there was no such thing as local history being taught or even being mentioned. I mean, history was something somewhere else. So when I came across this book, and this is the copy I got at that, that time, Historic Sligo, it really was an eye-opener. We had never thought of Sligo as being historic. I mean, we knew about Yates, and we knew Maeve was up on the top of Knocknaray, and we and Kulani probably knew about the two battles in Kaluni, the French and the Civil War one. But beyond that, we didn't know much of the history. And, um, you know, reading this was an eye-opener to me. It's, it was based on a bibliography, but it's much, much more than a bibliography. Now, at that time, I was in um, teacher training in St. Patrick's College, uh, Drumcondra. And as part of the history course, we were actually asked to do a local history project. So I decided to do one on my own native parish, which is Killorn Kulani, which... Uh, normally you wouldn't think much of, or you wouldn't think there was much history around that area. Now, in Historic Sligo, there is one page on Caloran, uh, and one reference, and in fact, when you read it, at least two of the things that John mentions in the Caloran page are not actually in the parish of Caloran. Tubbertulla and Well is outside the parish of Caloran, and Court Abbey, um, which is beside uh, Knocknashie, is outside on the other side. But it still, it still was a fantastic read. And it gave me leads to pursue in um, you know, general Sligo leads, which had information about Killorn and Kalani as well. 
So based on that, I did what was quite a good project, actually, and I kept at it over the years, and it eventually turned into a little history of Killorn and Killarney. And then based on that, I had got the, the research bug and the local history bug. So while I was doing that book, I met some survivors of the War of Independence and Civil War. So I decided to write a book, or research it at least, on what happened in Sligo during the War of Independence and Civil War, because I had no idea, really. So at that stage, this book had come out, um, Sligo, Sources of Local History. And this was very typical of John, I think. Not only did he continue and expand the work that was already going on in building up a local history uh, collection in it and making a catalogue, but he published it. And it's published, I suppose, in what you might call a very basic way, because he wanted to get the information out there to everyone else. He wanted to enthuse people. And in fact, in the introduction, he says that this is aimed not just at historians, not just at amateur or local historians, but it's aimed at the ordinary person who might be curious about something and would like to drop in and ask a question about a mill or a place name or something. So this, his, his work in local history was not aimed at local historians only. It was aimed at everybody. His remit, as he saw it himself, was to enthuse people. So at that stage, I went into the local history department. Uh, it must have been the late or middle 80s. The memory is going. But anyway, I met John McTiernan. Now, I, haven't, I didn't meet him many times, but I met him, and I explained what I was doing. And what you were struck which straight away was, the man is interested in me and what I'm doing. He has no agenda. Now, when you're researching the War of Independence and Civil War, everybody you talk to, okay, 75% of the people you talk to, you know, they're involved, and if they tell you uh, about what's going on in this, what, what happened in the Civil War, you know that they want to get their own side across, and that's just part of being a, being a researcher and you make allowances for that. But John had nothing. I, you know, everyone you talk to, you can figure out which, who they voted for at that time. With John, not a clue. He was there to help you. And of course, by the time this was published and I went in, there were more resources available. So he brought out the other resources, went through them, and he helped me immeasurably. And I was really struck by just the humility of the man and the helpfulness of the man. And, you know, based on that, then, I went ahead and did a book on the War of Independence and later on Civil War and so on. Thank you, thank you Michael. How important are John's publications to both local and national historians? Well, I, you know, there's a selection of them there. I think they were very important. I think um, certainly on that word, he's of Sligo, it's claimed as the first of its kind in Ireland. I think historic Sligo was probably the first of its kind in Ireland. And many of his books were the first of their kind in Ireland. And like when you look back at, um, I'd say the trilogy of books, you know, the, the um, old Sligo and other ones, and you start flicking through those, it's really astounding, like, what's in them. Like, going through those, even just this evening, I found, I think, 20 pages on the linen industry in County Sligo, with notes and references and a bibliography at the end. In maybe the same one or another one, I found an article on putching making in the 18th and 19th century. And I come from a long line of putching makers in Kulani, <laughs> and on both sides of the mountain, actually, in Dramard and Screen as well. So I was interested in that. And these are not just snippets he took out of newspapers. These are carefully worded, carefully written articles in that sort of lovely, I don't know how you describe the style, but it's just an easy-to-read style that he does. But at the same time, the learning behind it is immense, really. And the references then are very important to other historians. Thanks, thanks, Michael. I was going to ask you, um, how does he differ from O'Rourke and Wood Martin as a, as a historian? But I think the way you, you've already answered it, that he had a, 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 a casual, what were the words you just used, that he was able to relate yes, somebody, to people? I suppose it's 
it's, um, I know exactly what Michael encapsulated very well there. I mean, John has a particular style, and I can, you know, I, I've seen a lot of these books in their original form when John was typing them up, first of all, on the golf ball typewriter, and then he graduated to the electric typewriter. And then, thanks to uh, my colleagues in the Heritage Centre, he, he managed to master Word, you know. And I've, I've seen a lot of these in their infancy. I did a bit of proofreading for them on John, and John was a meticulous uh, researcher. Um, and he also had a particular style. It was never a judgmental style. It was very narrative. Um, and he drew on this huge font of knowledge in his head where he could you know, go from the linen trade to the putching trade to 19th century parliamentary elections and give you a contextualization of any particular time, place, or period he was writing about. And I just think, you know, there is so much in these books. I mean, as, John, or as Michael said, I open them up still and I go, OK, I didn't know that. You know, so it's, it's a compliment to the man. And uh, Fiona, you, you've said um, that John was particularly interested in the new computing technology, as in you've said it before to me, and, um, and he learned to type Word in his 70s. I'm still trying to figure out Word, so um, it seems to me that this was another example of his thirst for knowledge. Can you tell us about that achievement of his grappling with computer technology and... I so suppose when John retired, he, John never really wanted to retire, but more about that again. Um, and he eff effectively, he was the secretary of the Heritage Centre, and I see some of the staff at the Heritage Centre here tonight. And he really formed a very good bond. They were like a, another family to John. John. John was a man that retirement didn't suit, and I'm sure it's just that Dolores will agree with me there. So he had his little office in the Heritage Centre, and he would come in, he would do his notes, he would write them up, and then he would see you know, the, the trainees maybe working on, on the computer and he got very interested in that and he really wanted to know how it worked and he liked the idea he didn't have to type everything three times when he made amendments to something, which is what we do all the time. So I think the, the staff, I think Phyllis and, and Teresa and Adrian in the, uh, in the Heritage Centre trained him up in Word and I know it, it, it's a little bit of work. I can see Adrian there saying, oh God, I remember that. Um, but he did it. I mean, this is technology from the space age for a man who was born in the 20s and he did it because that was John's mind. He really, and he appreciated the, um, the beauty of it and how it would make his work easier, you know. So, um, and he, he, he did, the, he, got there, he got there eventually um, and uh, fair play to him for it. And you said on, on that same subject, you said in the days before computers, John would spend hours of his own time indexing the microfilms and hard copies of 19th century Sligo newspapers onto small index cards. Um, imagine the patience required and dedication and interest required to do that. Can you describe to us what that process entails and what do you think was John's driving force, the motivation that spurred him on in such a physically laborious process? That's a good question. I suppose to, for those of us who were old enough to remember the pre-computer age, card index are the only way to go. And, and I have been saved by card indexes that still survive. But John is the only man I knew who had a card index drawer in his living room, you know, right next to his seat where he had the typewriter on the computer. But he had literally thousands of cards. I, I think they may have gone to the library um, since. Um, and it's literally, you know, he, John was a, a bachelor man. He, he had plenty of things to do at night besides football when he wasn't doing the football. He would literally go through, he had his own little microfilm machine, and he would go through this, because it's a labour of love. I mean, I kind of know what it's like myself. You know, there's you and there's the source, and then you have to get it out. How do you find something if you don't have an index card? And certainly, um, I know he landed up to my house one time when I was doing the streets of Sligo with about four drawers of these index cards. And I where would I search in the pre-digital age, you know, without these? And I'm sure other historians have. Um, Michael, I think you might have experienced the white card uh, of John, you know. Um, it's, it's a labour of love over decades, really, and um, they still are a, 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 an enormous source. So, And um, you also described John as a pioneer in making local history access more accessible to the public. And that, to me, that seems so selfless and altruistic of him. Why do you think making local history more accessible meant so much to him? 
Well, I think he had a great love of Sligo, despite being 10 years in Cork and 10 years in Kilkenny. Um, he really was, uh, I don't even know if he was a Kulera man at heart, because it was always Drum Lahey and it was always Giva, it was always Conway's Cross, you know? And those were very strong images in his head. But it was Sligo. He, he realised the depth, as Michael has said, of history in Sligo. He realised the contribution that um, Sligo people had made to the world history. And he really encouraged, you know, I mean, I was terrified as a 19-year-old when I met John. He was the county library he was Mr McTiernan but you know he recognized that obviously I had some love for it and that as John as Michael said that's about that was the great beauty of John he, he could recognize that and he was self selfless you know he would give you any sort of information and as historians know we're all trying to protect our own sources you know uh, before published for somebody else publishes before you do John was not at all like that he was most generous uh, in in everything he, he in all the sources that he had and I think that um, it was his love for Sligo that that made him like that. Thanks, thanks, Fiona. Cahal, I'm going to come back to you. Uh, regarding Calera Strand Hill GAA, you've said, you've described Sean as a visionary. Um, you said he could see that the club needed to nurture talent in the boardroom as well as on the playing field, which I think is very interesting. He, pla he placed huge emphasis on the development of young people, um, encouraging them to take on roles off the playing field. Like he pushed the concept of having young management teams who could relate to the younger players. Can you talk about that concept a bit and his, his push to do that? Yeah, if I could first of all, Fiona, just say he most definitely was a Calera man at heart. <laughs> um, I, I can't let you away with that one. But um, yeah, like I suppose looking back in older days, the GAA club was the young lads played and the older guys did all the the stuff in the boardroom and I suppose when you were a young fella you wondered what they were at and you thought that they were doing nothing really and but Sean changed all that because well he he got us involved and he changed the idea like that he I suppose what he was trying to do was bring the older generation and the younger generations together and while the older generations couldn't come back and play football the younger generations and especially maybe the ones who weren't going to be all that successful maybe on the field there was a place for everybody and um, he he would have encouraged people try to get them into the boardroom he had myself as chairman when I was 31 years of age which I think it was the youngest ever chairman in the history of the club at that stage I think they've got younger since but um, also like he came up with the concept of guys managing teams that you know young lads playing football they were going to do their own thing if you tell them don't go on a solo run or don't bounce it they think what does he know so Sean got younger guys in um, who were more on a level par and the younger lads um, listened to them and it worked like because the teams immediately started to become successful I, I remember being manager of an under 16 team and in the mid 90s we came up against a really strong curry team who had won they actually won every championship and league from under 12 to minor. And when we first played them at under 16, they beat us by 36 points. Two years later, we came within two points of them in the championship. And I remember, like, we were disappointed to lose, but there was an air of excitement. And I was carrying the gear out to the car afterwards, and I looked over my shoulder, and Sean was coming behind me. And he just made one comment. He said, I think you're the guy to bring these boys forward. So that was me in the job for next year as well as, you know, there was going to be no bowing out. And, um, you know, loads of other lads come into management teams afterwards and it has paid dividend. Like uh, the 80s was a very important decade for for the club and was, I don't think it's any real coincidence that it was because Sean had come along in that decade you know the whole, all the work of the 80s culminated with winning an intermediate championship in 1989 and five or six years later we were up in senior and have stayed there ever since and um, like I, I suppose I, I meant to say earlier that he was Sean to us you know he we didn't know who John or John C was and if when we did eventually find out and we'd say it to him you know his wry sense of humor would come out and he'd know that we were there was a bit of devilment going on or whatever um yeah um but yeah definitely the success started to come after um Sean's work kept started to pay dividend great thanks Cahill. Michael I'm going to come back to you here um, when describing John's character you've said I was always struck by his unassuming manner, 
his obvious interest in whatever project you were involved in and his determination to help. There was never any sense of superiority or of a vested interest. What do you think are the traits that all historians have in common? <laughs> um, all historians have in common? Well, they're like, you know, dogs worrying a bone, really, aren't they? <laughs> you know, they've got something on their mind, whatever's on their mind at, their, at the moment, and they just go after it. Uh, and John wasn't like that, really. John was the opposite, I suppose. John knew a lot about a lot of things, and he was very willing to help. So when I went in there in the late 80s, one thing on my mind, War of Independence, Civil War as well, I need to find out stuff, what have you got? He was able to help me, and he was empathetic, he was unassuming, he, there was no proprietorial interest whatsoever. He shared anything he had, suggested other things. So <clears throat> I think, and I'm, I mean, there's another thing I should say about John. When you see all these books worthy of Sligo, we in Kulani knew that Sligo to him was County Sligo. Because very often we in Kulani, when we hear Sligo, you know, it's not County Sligo that's meant. And that's because we're way down, you know, on the periphery, forgotten very often and so on. But John was a County Sligo man. Any of his books, they're County Sligo. So the Wordies of Sligo, there's a lovely thing in that book, The Wordies of Sligo, which was originally published as Here's to Their Memory by Mercier, and then published again by John in, I think, when was it? In 1994. It was originally um, published in 1977. And he goes through about 100 Sligonians, as he called them, who made a mark in the world. And he didn't use that horrible word, forgotten, in the title. You know all these history books that are the forgotten story of the forgotten hero or the forgotten this? No, he didn't. Because you can't remember a hundred famous Sligonians. But he went through the, the hundred. And again, there's all kinds of people in there. There are Irish patriots in there. There are civil servants of the imperial government in there. There are landlords in there. There are people who fought against the landlords in there. They're all in there. They're all treated exactly the same. But at the end of it, he has this thing. Yeah, the geographical distribution of Sligo ability. And he goes through barony and parish and lists the people already mentioned in that way. Now, I should say that Killorn and Killani have no one in it. <laughs> but... You know, Kulera is there with two people. Sligo, as in Sligo Town, has a list. Gertjean, Kilcolman, a Connery, Kilvarnet, and so on. So he was a county Sligo man. M Michael, what is your favourite publication of his? My favourite publication, well, the publication that had the most effect on me was Historic Sligo. The publication that I used most was Sources of Local History, but my favourite is Worthies of Sligo. All those people, like over a hundred Sligo people who made an impression. And as someone who was writing, I was particularly interested in the poets and writers. And there's a list of 14 there. Now, there's the obvious... Um, well, he doesn't include Yeats. He does include Eva Gore Booth, which we knew about from primary school because we learned the little waves of Brefany off by heart. And in fact, just to can I digress completely yes. now? Um, Nora Nyland, it wasn't, yeah, yeah, who had been a previous, um, who had been a previous county librarian, often came out to us in Kulani in her car with books to change in the library in the boot of the car. And I remember her coming in one day and we were learning the little waves of Brefany go stumbling through my soul. And she gave us a little talk about it. And I still remember that. Anyway, that's just a digression. But the poets and writers here, and he begins with Reverend James Casey. Completely forgotten now and probably deservedly forgotten, but he still gets a few pages here and he's from that same area of South Sligo as John was from. And he was the poet priest, but also the priest of temperance. He wrote poems about temperance. And he, the clergy loved him. <laughs> and I suppose the people did as well. Here's an example. And John was very fond of quoting poetry 
in his books, poetry that had appeared, that had been published or had appeared in uh, local newspapers. John Jemison, Mavron John, I love your sight no more. I love you long, but now, John, my folly I deplore. Your smile was sweet and bright, John. Your breath was like the rose. But you have been to me, John, the cause of all my woes. <laughs> so, you know, there's a, there's a, what's the word? There's a nice touch like that here and there. A touch of humor, I suppose, that he brings in. A touch of levity as well. Um, he has Ty Doll O'Higgin, of course, a very, very famous poet from South Sligo. Michael J. Mullan and some of the O'Haras, and Philip Rooney, who was still um, read, I think, when I was young, from Colony, I think, wrote novels and only died in 1962. So I think that's my favourite my favorite uh, book, and that section on the poets and writers, uh, probably my favourite section. Thanks, thanks, Michael. Fiona, um, you have a very interesting anecdote, a great story about John, which reveals a lot about uh, his passion for his work and his reluctance to throw in the towel in his later years. Can you tell us about John accidentally neglecting to mention to Sligo County Council that he was past the compulsory retirement age. Yeah, this, this is one of those, uh, you know, really uh, humorous anecdotes, and it's typically John as well of the years. Um, I think this is 1995, and uh, I was at that mo at that time we were based across the heritage centre was based across the way here in the museum building, and it was a Monday, Tuesday morning, something like that, and I was running up as we did most days to the library, to the to the courthouse where John's office was at the time to get a microfilm. We borrowed the microfilms and brought them back later in the day. So went up the stone steps, I mean Donald will be familiar with these steps, the upstairs and down the long wooden corridor and John was coming along this corridor and he was, you know, John had a little way about him and he said, well, did you hear? And I said, did I hear what? Uh, did you hear that they got me? And I said, uh, no John, who got you? <laughs> oh, the crowd in the council. And I said, how, how did they get you? He said, oh, well, somebody found out that I should have retired six months ago and they wanted to know why I didn't tell them. And he said, why would I tell them? Sure, I don't want to retire. What would I do retiring, you know? So he effectively, I think, struck a deal with the council that he could stay for a few more months um, until they finalised all the paperwork. But uh, it, was, it was compulsory retirement age, obviously, you know? But John, as I said, didn't really want to retire in, in that sense, um, in that work. Was it his life? It was his life to a certain extent, but it was because he enjoyed being there. But I always, that's one of those, you know, funny ones from John. I, I love that story. And Cahill, um I want to know about Peter Cooney's infamous shed. <laughs> what went on in Peter Cooney's infamous shed? What can you reveal to us? Immediately Eamon Mullen is rubbing his head and <laughs> laughing there. Um, I, it was in, there were the, old, the elder statesmen, as I called them, um, and they weren't drinkers, so that type of thing, but they loved each other's company, and they... Uh, their favourite hobby was discussing the pa everything in the parish. They knew everything that went on, and even if you thought they didn't know, they knew. And they'd arrive up every evening, um, sit on the round the bales of hay, and they'd chat for hours and hours. And I suppose as young fellows, we were probably a bit paranoid that they were talking about us, and you know, it, you'd maybe go around the long way rather than pass by, because if you passed, you knew you'd be a topic of conversation. And um, it was innocent times I suppose you know but Sean loved to be in the middle of that and it, the, the chat and talking to those people it was one of his favorite things his favorite pastimes he was as equally at home sitting on the bale of hay in Petey Cooney's hay shade as he was in in all of the learned um, environment but he was also then like really uh, comfortable maybe come into the local pub or whatever and he'd sit down with the younger guys and chat with them he could relate with those guys the same way as they relate among themselves he had a keen interest in the health and well-being of everybody in the club uh, you know if he heard that somebody maybe was injured or whatever he'd send on a card or best wishes for a speedy recovery if some guy had maybe opted out of playing football sean would try and come up with a plan to get them back and it didn't matter whether they were good or bad he just wanted them up there because he knew that the important thing was to keep everybody participating as i said earlier if they weren't going to make it on the field he'd have a job for them somewhere else thanks carl 
I'm sure you haven't revealed all the secrets, but some of them. Um, we're going to have a question and answer session shortly, but first, Fiona is going to close our little conversation here. She's going to read out something, something personal to the McTiernan family. Yeah, um, just, I mean, John was a huge influence on my life. I knew him for many, many decades. COVID, like everything else with older people, just chopped that off. I, I, the last time, not the last time I saw John, but I met him in the Sligo Park for lunch shortly before the, the whole COVID thing um, hit. And he, he was getting frailer and, and that and older, but he was still John as such. But um, COVID then just cut him off. And I'm sure Sister Dolores knows this. Like any older person, it really you need to be engaged with people you need to 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 keep your mind going and i think that was probably you know uh, for for everybody that was a bit difficult but um uh, John, as I said, was a huge influence in my life. I really enjoyed his company. I spent a lot of time on the road with him up and down to Roscommon, and we were involved in so many different publications, just even from a friendship point of view and looking at proofs and things like that. But um, what I'd like to do is just quote from um, uh, the mass booklet that was at John's mass, because I found that that really encapsulates the, the, the faces of Sean and John and in his many, his many different attributes. And, and it's, I know that John um, was born on St. John's Eve, if I'm correct, uh, which was bonfire night. I think I'm correct at that. He always made a point of saying that. And just, I'd like to read out um, the McKernan's family personal obituary to their brother, their uncle, which was part of his funeral mass and very um, well articulated by his nephew, Martin. So just quote, John Charles McTiernan, a distinguished librarian, eminent historian, genealogist and author. His life's work has provided an invaluable academic record for future generations. AKA Sean, a cherished brother, proud uncle and granduncle, and role model to four generations of the McTiernan family, while also being a loyal and engaging friend, neighbor, colleague, and club mate to many people in Sligo and beyond. John, here's to your memory. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona, a really tribute, a really fitting tribute to, to John. Um, so we're, we're going to have a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question of any of the panel members, can you just raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you? Or if you have any comments you'd like to make. There's, a, there's an up front here. Um, this is just a, a comment. Everybody on the panel referred to all his historical and other booklets or books that he produced. But as a member of this esteemed Colera Strand Hill Club, I want to acknowledge his contribution in terms of our history. He produced our centenary book, and our one to five. So I just like that to be recorded and thank him. No, that's the County Sligo GA history. <laughs> that, that's a wider one. This is one he devoted his time and it's a great read. So I don't know whether it's in the library, but we can get copies for the library. So I'd like to mention that. Great, thank you. There's a question over here. Well, coming from Riverstown, I would like to also pay our good wishes or contribute to, to John this evening. John was a great friend of us in the Folk Park in Riverstown. He contributed greatly to our library there and all the rest of it. He also came out and gave us talks and lectures on the locality. His knowledge, he didn't have to have notes. He just talked off the top of his head, actually, and it was wonderful. And um, I often wondered why John was not actually made a free man of Sligo, actually. I think he would have deserved it, actually, for all the work he did for Sligo. Um, he brought all his books out to us. I have his 13, I think his 13 books signed by him personally to me. Um, there, you can read them twice, you can read them three times and they're always interesting. I know you mentioned earlier on about his notes. When visiting John in the 80s, 
He could go up to his file and take down little notes pertaining to my local area, which was of interest to us. So I'd like to thank him tonight. I know he's dead now, but to remember him in that way. Thank you. Thank you. John had no knowledge at all of the sea. So when he was doing the port section, I introduced him to a good many at Ross's Point pilots and uh, Captain Frank Devaney. And I think when Frank Devaney was using nautical terms, yes, when he was using nautical terms, John didn't know what he was talking about. And on one particular occasion, he was getting tired again. He said, well, you were ever down the river on a boat? And he said, no, and I have no notion of going. And, and then he says, were you ever out the bay? No, or I have no notion of going out there. What the hell are you writing about the port and about the bay for? But anyway, Memory Harbor turned out to be a, a fabulous book that has, was reprinted. And uh, also, I wish again to thank John for all his help. We, we went on many missions when he was writing on the, the, the North Sligo families and the houses of Sligo. And um, also I'd like to thank Fiona Gallagher there, who <laughs> we often talked about John. Just one, one he, had, <clears throat> he was exceptional with English language. And uh, we had one part, there was a ship that broke its back on the, on, on, in the channel in 1923. And um, I didn't want to put down um, broke its back. And I said it broke amidships. No such word. John said there's no such word as amidships. So, yeah, like, very seldom would he, would he question anything. He would also encourage, and he encouraged me so much that I eventually got the book finished. So, thank, I, again, thank you. And oh, I was also so welcomed in John's house and in the family and Sister Dolores and all the rest of the family. So I, was, I was, have great memories of John and wish again to thank the family and John. Thank you. John on this occasion. John was a great man. I would have met him on a few occasions and any time he asked him questions he was always very helpful. He could never say no to you. And if you had something and you would give it to a member doing a family tree and John, I gave it to him and he said if I can help you, I'll help you. That's the way he was. And like when we look at Sligo, it's deep, deep in history. One time we had Wood, uh, uh, Wood Martin's research, we had O'Rourke's and then we had Tyke Gallons and that's what we were tied into. And now when you look at the bookshelf behind, we see so many books, and what Brian was talking there, I know his voice there, he brought out a great book, Fiona, Porrick Dine, there's so many writers in Sligo now bringing all this history to the fore, and it's a great thing. And maybe now there's a research centre over in Bridge Street, maybe we should call it the John McTiernan Research Centre, Give him, and then put all the books of John and all the other Sligo people into that area, because it's great, the girls over there are extremely helpful, and I often go in there and go through the, the independently. It's amazing the amount of stories you come across and the history and what you read. And you have to have an open mind. We were in different times 100 years ago, 150 years ago. Bring all that to the future. Because a lot of the kids nowadays, they're not hearing any sort of history. They're going on to a, a Google and they read a story and they think it's not. But Sligo is surrounded. We have it everywhere. North, south, east and west. So John is looking down on us all and hopefully Sligo won't forget him in what lies ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I can't let the evening go without thanking John for all the work that he did with us at the Heritage and Genealogy Centre and all the great fun we had with him because John was a very funny man as well as I'm sure Fiona will concur. Uh, we used to have great great laughs on a, sometimes on a Monday and Tuesday because we get to hear about John's exploits at the weekend. So um, I, I there were so many houses that John recorded, uh, both you know in, in his books, but also he, he, he took photographs of many of them as well. And uh, we didn't; a lot of people wouldn't have realised that John risked life and limb for a lot of these photographs because he was surrounded by dogs at one house, and he scaled a wall in another in another place, and 
nearly ripped his clothes on. But one of the funniest ones was um, he was going up to one of these fine houses in Sligo, a lot of which now have disappeared since. And a big long driveway in. This uh, gardener st st walks out into the middle of the laneway and stops, stops John. Who are you, sir? And he says, I'm John McTurnan. And uh, what are you doing here? And he says, I've come to take a photograph of the house. And your man says, well, this is private property. Turn back. You know, absolutely not. And John says, I, he says, I'll just go up here and turn. So John <laughs> carries on in his little Ford Fiesta, probably in second or third gear, and up around the front of the house, takes a picture, jumps into the car, and flies down the, the driveway out again. So, I mean, you know, he was just, he was so funny, like, and uh, he had a way of telling stories as well that would leave a lasting impression. So thank you to John, and thanks thanks to the library as well for hosting this event this evening. It's a lovely tribute to John, and I'm so happy to see it all. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. I think, I think we might be ready to close the event if anybody else has any other questions or comments. Now's the time. But we're, we're going to, one more, one more. Uh, Tommy Kilcoyne. Uh, following on what Eamon Mullen said about the history of Coolera Strand Hill GEA Club that John compiled, I would like to, re to remember John particularly for his work on the Sligo GEA centenary history. The GEA was founded in 1884. Michael is holding it there. And 100 years later, in the early 80s, Sligo County Board was looking around for somebody who would put together a history association in the county. Sligo GEA has a very proud history over a long period. Maybe not huge success on the field, but off the field and in the clubs and the volunteerism that's involved, it has a very proud record. John inevitably was the man that was asked to take on that huge task. And he, he, he took it on. He edited the history. And he was assisted by Christina Murphy from Tubber Curry, uh, Sean McGoldrick from Leitrim, who was a reporter with the Sligo Champion at that time and is still working with uh, the Irish Independent and the Sunday World. And the late John Benson, who was the County Board Public Relations Officer at that time. And John, of course, took on the most difficult task, the period right from the beginning of the association. And he researched that, and he did an absolutely wonderful job. And it, it received kudos all over the association for the amount of research and work that was done. 25 years later, in 2009, the county board asked me to update the history and to edit the history, an updated version. Fortunately, I had John to call on and he was a very willing helper, and I spent so many evenings with him and with Rory O'Byrne working on the history, and he, he did, again, he did a wonderful job, and I would like to pay tribute to him on behalf of anyone who was associated with the GEA in County Sligo for the tremendous interest he took in everything GEA, as well as his other wider interests, and Cahill has outlined very well what he, what he did out in Culera even though he was an immigrant from Giva. <laughs> and finally, I would like to pay tribute to, to John. Michael mentioned Nora Nyland, and as a former primary school principal myself, I have the same memories of Nora Nyland arriving to the school with a box of books in the back of her car and instilling great interest in the pupils in literacy and in reading. And John continued on that in his role as Sligo County Librarian. He was a regular visitor to schools. And before he retired, as far as I know, he ensured that the reports of the Folklore Commission, the, the, the details for each area, were given to each primary school in the county to make sure that could be used as a resource for the future. Oliver Goldsmith once referred to the village schoolmaster and the wonder grew that one small head could carry all he knew. But certainly, I always marveled at, at John McTiernan, what a gentleman he was, and that one small head could carry all he knew. Thank you. Declan Bree, I'd like to uh, thank the library service for 
organising this evening's event. I think it was fitting that John would be remembered in such a manner. Um, and I'd also like to thank the panel for sharing their memories. And I'm just wondering, given the fact that John was always busy, never idle, was he working on any project before he became ill? I'm not sure if the, any of the panel might know, or maybe someone in the audience. Um, work that John published was uh, probably his least known publication about the parliamentary elections for County Sligo uh, from 1700 right up to the 1918 election and I do recall him saying that that was it, he was going to quit after that, now that was a, a Maria quit um, he had he'd worked, done a, some publications for the Corrin Herald and I, th I think he had kind of resigned himself to that was it at the time um, but he had kind of worked through all his index cards, he had gone through everything and, but he still didn't stop him um, writing articles for the Corrin Herald and that but I don't, I, don't, I don't think, I think that was it, the last one um, a very good publication and probably as I said his least known one, so, but excellent So I, I think we're going to close the event now, thank you all so much for coming and I hope we did um, John Tribute. Um, what a wonderful evening, I think, and uh, listening to historians and people working in the community of Sligo, it affirms all those thoughts we have of John, of his generosity and his sense of heart of the community. I think that's reflected here this evening. And I'd just like to say, we could have asked about 20 local historians to come up here tonight and talk about how they have benefited from knowing John as county librarian or as John in their community. Tonight, I just think that when Mike was talking about his favorite books, I tend to agree with him because I'm putting on my librarian's hat here. And when I look at the wordies of Sligo, when I first came here as county librarian to replace John in 1995, and I remember speaking with him, and he gave me kind of a guided tour of the local history and what was involved. And we had the Nyland collection as well. And it was just like an Aladdin's cave to anyone who is interested in art, art history, history of, and the county of Sligo. And I've worked in five library authorities, has the greatest wealth of intact history. It's incredible. When you go chasing after history material to add to the collection, it's at a premium. Such is the demand for it, and also such is the importance of it. Because Sligo, by default, and look at the wordies of Sligo, it's, not, its history is not just of the local area. Its importance is international. And that was brought home to me when we discovered the workhouse records of Sligo. And I brought them for a heritage event over in the Glasshouse, and I hadn't arrived back in my office 10 minutes and I was getting emails from all over the world looking for access to that. Through Facebook and whatever way, Twitter and all, this was put up and immediately it had had a reaction. And I just want to mention another thing. That card index that they refer to is a treasure trove of history. It's my first port of call when something came up of Sligo. And I recall the value of that when a letter on Sotheby's auction came up for sale about 20 years ago, and it was a letter when J Jack was a child here in Sligo, and he attended school up here in Mal. And it's referred, it was miscatalogued, and saying he was going to a Christian soiree that evening. But you go to the, the, the card index, which we have now bound in books in the local history collection, and you check Christian. And yes, lo and behold, there's a J.M. Christian who had a school up here. Two things, provenance immediately and accuracy it was worth going after. On that letter, he's right to his mother, on that letter are two images drawn by Jack Beats. That goes to show you the value of that research that John did decade after decade after decade. And then, like all good local historians, that collegiate approach, that cooperative approach, and again I put on my librarian's hat, we are about giving access, and you've heard about John as well, we're about giving access to material and assisting the history of Sligo to be written, to be revisited, to be put there for others to take. And when I look at wordies of Sligo, I think of the child looking for a Leaving Cert project to do. And it's a wonderful start because it's local, it's people that went before great Sligonians. And I think posthumously, if 
We could do it. I'd love to put John in there because he deserves to be in there. We all agree on that, I'm sure. So in terms of his book work, it's just absolutely phenomenal what he produced. And I said before, and I'll say it again, the breadth of subject matter is astounding. And his style of writing changes. And I love Memory Harbour, simply because I have an interest in the sea. Unlike, unlike John, I'd love Beyond the Bay. But it is a fantastic mix. And it fills in for the academic study in the eighth as much as the history of Sligo. It's that brilliance he had. I took a fantastic head he had. In terms of um, tonight, I'd just like to mention as well, I think he was involved in the diocesan history as well of, uh, of Erfin. And that, he did phenomenal work on that. I am now just going to finish up, and I'd like to thank, first of all, our moderator, Neve, for doing a wonderful job researching this area and asking lovely questions, I felt. I think they were very, very poignant, some of the questions that were posed. And I'd like to thank Michael for contributing as well. And this is the mix we like to get. We were talking about county and, and the town of Sligo, and we think we've got that in, between Michael and Fiona. <laughs> And also, as I mentioned, with Cahal, you get that essence of the, what librarians like to think. We like to reflect the community. We like to be at the heart of the community. And there's no greater heart of the community in GAA because they encapsulate what's happening in a lot of communities across the country. And they're great at going out and engaging with communities, particularly the COVID-19, they excelled as well and all of that. So I'd just like to thank all three. Of you. Thank you very much. Very fitting. And I'd like to thank John's family and Sister Laura's in particular for coming and the people watching online or across the world as well and to welcome him in here tonight. And in terms of um, the technical side of things here, I'd like to thank James again and Studio Rove. I'd like to thank Kate for a wonderful musical interlude at the start there. And also I'd like to thank library staff. And we in, in, in Sligo Library are very proud of John and a lot of staff that are here tonight would have worked closely with John as well. And I think in particular of Anna, who would have assisted with typing some up the entries to that local studies guide. And I'll, my final comment on the local studies, the pink book in particular, I started in libraries in Roscommon in 1983, and I remember picking that up and saying, wow, that's the way to go. At that stage, I was interested. I had a great county librarian to work to, Helen Kilkline was common, and she had a great interest, like a lot of county librarians in local history. And she introduced me to that, and I said, that's fantastic. And it's something all the library services should be doing. And today, we're now at a national committee looking at digitizing everything. So the program of that will commence because there's been a massive interest and uptake in local studies. We were nearly going to go over the cliff's edge, I believe, when we were going to take history off our curriculum. I think sense prevailed. It is who we are. We learn who we are. We've been through a decade of commemoration there. And to be quite honest, I was nervous about some aspects of it. But thankfully, the history is there, and we can read about it. And simple history and chasing after resources all the time. And if you know of any resources out there for the library, please point us in the direction. We all the time are taking donations of, of primary sources in particular. And I'd just like to thank everyone tonight for making, I think, a wonderful event, a fitting event for a real gentleman and a fantastic librarian and excellent historian. Thank you. We'll have one final tune, I believe, from Kate, yeah. and uh, over to you. Thank Great, you thank much. you very much, Donald. Um, so I'm going to finish up now with two tunes on the fiddle. I'll do a slow air. This one is called Cape Clear, which is an island off the coast of Cork. And then I'll finish up on a lively note with a reel uh, called Sailor on the Rock. So thanks very much for having me, and I hope you enjoy. <laughs> 